First of all, I just want to say it's a real joy to stand here today and see all you young people. It just makes your heart lift and think that we got hope we can win this struggle. Uh, well, let me just tell you, let me tell you, I'm, I'm homegrown. I was born in here in Detroit in September the 6th, 1941 at the old St. Alvin Hospital. Uh, Dr. Ocean Sweet delivered me, slapped me on my butt when I came out of my mama's womb. So he not only gave me my birthright, but passed on a legacy of struggle, and I tried to live to carry that out the rest of the days of my life. Uh, let me just say this, the Detroit Rebellion in 1967 is a defining moment in this city's history. Uh, I, uh, at that time, was working at the Dodge Main plant. We were working 12 hours, seven days a week. Uh, I didn't get off work on the afternoon shift to 3 a.m. in the morning, and everybody that got off with me went to various blind pigs all over the city. It was part of our life. You work afternoon shift, get off, and go to the blind pig because the bar is closed, and that became part of your daily activity. Uh, so when the rebellion broke out in uh, uh, about 6 o'clock that morning on 12th Street in Claremont, I was right there Johnny, on the spot. I was living three blocks from there on Gladstone. Uh, after the police came and tried to raid the blind pig, and, and it was surrounded by about 100 workers on the street that started throwing bricks at the police, then people broke down the street and went to the pawn shops first. Now, you got to understand a thing about that, that almost everybody back then lived off the pawn shop. You work and get paid on Friday, go buy you some stuff, and by Wednesday the next week, you had to put it in the pawn shop to have enough to eat the next two days. And if you ever pawned anything, you know, on the back of your pawn slip, it says in great big letters, not responsible for fire, theft, or other unavoidable accidents. So everybody, the first people that went into the pawn shops had to go in there to try to get their own stuff back. Obviously, they took somebody else's when they was in there. <laughs> I was arrested on the first night for violation of curfew and did uh, 15 days in Ionia State Penitentiary waiting to come back to trial. Uh, it's a lot of characteristics of the Detroit Rebellion that was different than other rebellions. Uh, first of all, everybody proclaims that the Detroit Rebellion was integrated uh, the first person killed uh, in the Detroit Rebellion was a white worker that was looting a store down on Trumbull. Uh, when, I, when they carried me down on you, I had two white guys on my bus that was arrested for sniping. Uh, secondly, the Detroit Rebellion is the only one that had an assassination that took place during the, during the course of the rebellion, and that's the Algiers incident, the Algiers Motel incident that no longer exists. Uh, the first thing they did was rename it to the Desert Inn, and that lasted a few years, and now, now it closed it, and when you get to Virginia Park and Woodward, it's a gated community with a brick wall there, and the Algiers Motel have been wiped off the pages of history. And when you go to the school systems in the city, you can't find a book, the Algiers Motel incident, because they don't want kids to know about it. The other factor of the Detroit Rebellion that made it different was they arrested so many people. They arrested over 7,000 people during the Detroit Rebellion. They sent us to, to Marquette, Milan, Jackson, uh, up with me at Ionia. They filled up all the prison systems in the state. And when they was finished with that, they rested, rested, sent the rest of the people to Belle Isle. So when you talk about Belle Isle as a place for lecture, it became a jail. We called it Belcatraz. The other factor I think is important to know that those uh, National Guards shot up this city. Anybody that went into the rebellion that didn't hate the police had to hate them when the rebellion was over. They shot over 150,000 rounds of ammunition with those 50 caliber machine guns over the city. They had so many shell casings laying on the ground that we picked up the empty 50 caliber machine gun shells, put rawhide on them, and wore them for necklaces as a symbol to the rebellion. I don't know if any of y'all remember that. But the biggest lesson that we learned out of rebellion was that when they established curfew, if you got sick, you couldn't go to the hospital. If you got hungry, you couldn't go to get no food. But if you had a badge from Chrysler, Ford, or General Motors, you would get through the police line, the National Guard line, and the Army line to take your butt to work. Uh, we learned a fundamental lesson out of that, 
that the only place that black people had any value in the society was at the point of production. And that's why we turn our efforts towards organizing in the factory. And, and with the, within uh, a year's time after the Detroit Rebellion, drum was born. And that was the basis of our struggle and the drum movement that grew out of that. The stress I wanted to make was where the struggle to organize the workers came from. It drew out of the rebellion. We learned the fundamental lesson, took that lesson, applied it, and was victorious with it for a while. Ron, I'm gonna pass you the torch. All right. Feels good tonight to be here. When Jan was talking about